talk to you today. I'm Marie. I'm Marco and we are Sayop and uh, we can't play the piano or sing or dance, but we make commercials that hopefully people want to watch. Well, um, we were told that we're breaking the TED rule by having two speakers on stage together, but uh, here's the reason why. We um, play, dream and create every day and our relationship is integral to what we do. Marie and I and three other friends started Sayop uh, in an old bar in the East Village close to Avenue C, and which still had a liquor license at the time um, because we felt that our studio needed a place to hang out rather than work. And we used to come there, play foosball all the time anyway, so now we would go to our favorite bar basically in order to actually do some work. And that wasn't a stretch at all. And at the time we didn't even have a conference room, so we would gather in little groups on the street corner and uh, to discuss things and sometimes total strangers would just, just chime in. So <laughs> <laughs> we, now we had this place where we could exchange ideas and, and explore and uh, you know, just try stuff out. And we invited all our friends to come over and then pretty soon ad agencies found us. And, uh, but we learned that uh, creating something needs to be fun and you have to enjoy the process. Well, this very important essence of playing and exploring is still at the core of what we do today. And, you know, we, we try and discover new ways to do stuff every day. Mm. And uh, when you're surrounding yourself with people that are just as excited as you are to create something, play comes naturally. And you don't really fear doing something different because it might be stupid. You just try it anyway. Um, so we all know that fear could really stifle creativity. Growing up, I had this ritual in the morning that in between putting on my socks, I got stuck. So I would take a pair of socks out of the drawer, sit there, put one on, hold the other one in my hand, and would just forget to continue. And it, he didn't even know this was happening until we moved in together. And uh, I pointed this out to him, and I called it his sock dream. So um, he can't really sock dream every day anymore because I'm usually standing fully dressed, waiting for him at the front door. Right. But those moments of silence, not stimulated by any actions or noise or thoughts, are still very precious to me, as well as discovering details in, in everyday items. You can always find things that you haven't seen before, like Richard just told us, peeling the banana from the other side. <laughs> and uh, when I was hiking as a kid, I would always look at the floor, and, and even though the landscape was, was really great, what I was really interested in was the moss growing at the edge of the, the path or the, the reflection in the little puddle, the two bugs humping each other. But when you grow up, the distance to the floor becomes so much bigger and you're missing out on a lot of good stuff down there. Well, when, when we were speaking at um, another conference, we met Joan Alera, a neuroscientist. He actually um, explores how the creative process works and how we, we, we decide. And so what was really interesting to us was um, how much information is actually stored in the unconscious part of the brain and how much of this information is actually being used when we create. So we probably still see little bugs humping on the side of the path, but we can't process it all. Um, so when by daydreaming and uh, tapping into the unconscious, we, it sort of, uh, we feel that it really helps us to create imagery that is emotionally charged and makes us feel. And if it feels right to us, it'll most likely feel the same for others, I hope. And that's all the theory, but looking at the process of one of our favorite uh, films, we show you how we create. And this brief for, for uh, the MTV promo was wide open, make something about music. Right, so we were home cooking. Um, it was a cold, snowy night, and, um, and we were listening to Beethoven's Moon Knight Sonata, and somewhere out of my unconscious mind came these imagery of birds. I guess cooking is kind of <laughs> the way I sock dream. Uh, so at first I saw individual birds as notes, and then an entire flock as melody sort of filling the space. And, um, birds being such lyrical creatures, I immediately felt this connection between the birds, the notes, and Beethoven's score. And I remember calling out to Marco, got it, I got it. It's got to be birds, black birds, it's got to be it. And be before I could even finish, Marco was finishing my thought for me. And later we understood that the piece was actually being made in our minds in the months leading up until this moment without us consciously realizing this. Mm -hmm. 
A couple of months before, we were at this empty field in Berlin, and uh, it was one of those very cold, gray winter days, no colors anywhere, and out of this monochromatic landscape lifted up this insane amount of little black dots, and they would form structures in the air just to fall back into chaos, and then restructure in some sort of pattern again. It was, it was just beautiful to watch. And then when you call something else that many of you probably experienced but maybe didn't notice, when you drive through a forest in the winter and you look outside of the side window, the forest looks extremely dimensional. I mean, technically it's just called parallax where objects in the foreground move much faster than objects in the background. But we are so fascinated by it that we had to drive back and forth a couple of times. <laughs> and here's another cool thing. If you actually put your nose against one of those trees, the dots on the bark become gigantic. And that's just playing with scale, I guess. Well, obviously, <laughs> it works for him because he has a big nose. But um, I couldn't focus on anything. But um, anyway, so I, I thought he was acting really silly at the time. But later, of course, realizing that playing with, with scale is a really cool thing. So what do we make of all of this? Um, we just took these elements like birds, trees, uh, music, and drew them out of our memory. and. Uh, started to brainstorm with our team. And uh, we asked ourselves, how do we visualize music? What is music? Music is emotion, it's memory, it's passion, it's pattern, it's tension that transitions to release. It's pretty much everything, um, as Nietzsche would put it in a very German way. But uh, uh, without music, life would be a mistake. Um, so when things felt right, connections are formed, and together as a team, we made this piece. It is said, um, if you love what you do, you don't have to work a day in your life. Well, to love what you do and to create something with somebody you love is probably one of the hardest things to do, but it's also the most rewarding. Well, <laughs> yeah, obviously we have differences of opinion and we even had to negotiate what to say today. But <laughs> if you value others' perspectives, we really believe that it can lead to better results. So together we play around observe unusual details in everyday items, sock dream or cook, and it gives us great inspiration. Our everyday life, our shared experiences, the things we see on our walk home, the arguments, the love, all that feeds into our work. Or do we call it life? And that's the reason why we're both up here together. And if we had our way, we would share the stage with everyone at PSYOP. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs>